call this meeting back to order. Uh, this is now our third uh, panel dealing with the report of the Standing Senate Committee on National Security and Defense. Uh, we continue to have Health Canada here, uh, Public Safety Canada, uh, Trevor Bootsing uh, has uh, joined us. Uh, we also have uh, Rachel uh, Huggins, Huggins, is it? Uh, from the Canadian Border Service Agency, we have Carl Demeray, and uh, we continue to have uh, our representation from the uh, RCMP. Oh, they've now moved up to the table. So Chief Superintendent Paul, Paul Bouchain, Chief Superintendent Dennis uh, Daly, and Paul Boudreau are all here from the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. So, now this particular report uh, from the Senate Committee on National Security and Defense does not have specific recommendations. Uh, it, it has a short report with a number of observations and a number of concerns that are raised do you have any uh, initial comments about these uh, concerns that are raised? Or do you want me to go right to questions? So, Mr. Chair, I think, I think it would probably make a lot of sense to go straight to questions. Okay. All right. Uh, so, uh, colleagues, uh, start with uh, Senator Petty Clare. Yes, Thank you, Chair. My question is rather simple. When I look at the report, I think in terms of the information, when we talk about basic security of Canadian travelers that could be inconvenienced. Some witnesses spoke about that. They said there could be delays or questions asked when we travel perhaps to the, for example, to the United States. And so I have a simple question. There don't seem to be such complicated solutions. There can be education and information for travelers in some locations. So I just want to ask you, is this all being prepared right now? Is it ready? And will it be implemented as soon as this bill is adopted? question, uh, Chair and Senator. I would just say, yes, these uh, discussions, just more generally, um, have been going on for quite some time with um, our American uh, colleagues across a range of issues uh, that have been raised in terms of uh, Canadian travelers uh, going to the United States. And so in terms of the timing of this, there's active engagement at many different levels. Um, I would just say that um, there are some difficult questions. Um, to sort through, and a number of those questions have been raised here uh, by various Senate committees. I would just say that um, we're working through those issues uh, with our American colleagues. Um, I would just say that um, two things. Um, one, we're working on some of the issues in terms of uh, at the border with American colleagues, uh, in terms of their posture uh, towards this proposal. But at the same time, we're also working on um, public awareness as you raised uh, for Canadians because there will be there will be implications uh, the import and exportation of cannabis across the border remains illegal uh, and so we just don't want confusion for Canadians in terms of what is possible when, when going across the border I would just say that to, in general I just wanted to reiterate the point really quickly uh, chair that you know Canadians who wish to enter the United States or any other country they have to adhere to um, a sovereign state's local laws uh, to gain entry into that country. And so I think, you know, in terms of a general sort of sense of what we're trying to communicate to Canadians is that um, what are the laws of uh, uh, the U.S. government uh, around cannabis and their federal regime? Um, having said all that, um, we are trying to figure out what, are, what is the American stance with respect to cannabis. Um, and what we, they have indicated to us uh, is that, for example, in primary questioning, they don't plan on changing their posture around that. How that will all play out and how, how that will be implicated uh, 
is yet to be determined in terms of uh, what the actual practice will be. That being said, we're in active discussions with uh, our American counterparts in many different channels, through the Public Safety Channel, through other colleagues that are here from other federal departments that are represented. So maybe I'll just leave it there, Chair. Merci. Okay, mm -hmm. that's it. Okay, uh, Senator Seidman. Thank you all of you again uh, for being here. Um, if I look at the report uh, that came from the Standing Senate Committee uh, on National Security and Defense, there's a, a lot of um, repetition uh, of the word awareness campaign right through many recommendations or suggestions, encouragement um, to the government. And so I guess what I'd like to ask you about is um, awareness campaigns for Canadians about what they might expect when they cross the border. Um, so number four, for example, the awareness campaign should make it clear to Canadians that they may be denied entry into the United States if they admit to previous cannabis use. Although Canadian officials who appeared before that committee stated an awareness campaign would be launched soon, the committee suggested that additional efforts should be made in the coming months to ensure that Canadians understand the seriousness of the consequences they will face if cannabis is found in their possession at the border or if they admit to previous cannabis use. So I'd like to hear where we are in, in, in this process of how to uh, make Canadians aware and help them prepare for what they might face when they cross the border with special re regard to this particular issue. The potential of being banned for life, for example, from the US uh, for admitting to something that the Canadian government is going to be making legal. Yeah, thank you for the question, Chair. And Senator, just with respect to public awareness, I think this is a key and critical piece in terms of explanation to Canadians on uh, what, what, what actually is the law. And again, I would just reiterate the fact that we are dealing with a sovereign state that sets its laws with respect to um, uh, import and exportation of, of drugs. That being said, in terms of the public awareness for Canadians, that process is, is underway. Um, there are a number of different uh, components to that piece, uh, and I'll just have maybe particular colleagues speak to, to their piece of the public awareness uh, that they're working on. But I mean, that, that will be a campaign that will deal with, for example, uh, tra travel advisory sort of uh, information to Canadians, educating uh, them on what the, the U.S. law actually is, um, and we, we plan on engaging Canadians in a number of different forms, including social media and active sort of public awareness. One of the big issues um, is signage at the border. So uh, those types of um, operational activities are underway uh, in terms of uh, moving forward. I don't think there's necessarily disagreement uh, in terms of some of the recommendations are here. Um, most of these actions here are actually uh, operationally um, either occurring or are uh, being planned to occur. So that being said, I would just say that uh, public awareness is a key component, I think, uh, for us moving forward. And I would just say in terms of the timing, um, that public awareness uh, is imminent. There's already been public awareness more generally about uh, the cannabis legalization and regula uh, regulation regime. I think the Canada-US piece is one that we've been focusing on. Um, there have been, as I mentioned, there have been ongoing discussions with our American colleagues, and those are continuing. So let me just leave it there and see if other colleagues wanted to comment on maybe the specifics of public awareness. Anybody else on this? Just, just very quickly, and it's a very specific point, because I think Trevor did a good job outlining that there are a number of broad-based, how do you communicate with all Canadians who are contemplating traveling, and what are the rules, and these sorts of things, and I won't repeat what Trevor said. Um, one very, very small detail, that, but I think it's an important point for, 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 to your question. Uh, as a part of our proposed regulations, um, with every unit sold in a provincial retail store, the consumer will be provided with um, a consumer fact sheet. And there'll be a, a basic information about the health harms, the health risks associated with consuming cannabis and some other key details, including the rules around 
taking it across the border. So you can be assured that at every point of transaction, anyone who purchases cannabis with the product that they buy at, you know, at the cash register, they will be handed or will be put in the bag a little card that has all sorts of key facts, including basic messaging around not taking it, you know, keep it in Canada, don't take it across borders, these sorts of things. So I thought I'd just offer that. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Senator uh, Gold. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is really uh, a question about the border uh, issues. Um, we know that the United States has the ability to ban for life, as, uh, and we heard testimony to that effect in other committees. Um, uh, if you admit to cannabis use, I mean, that's a problem. That's a problem yesterday, today, and, and, and may not change uh, after legalization. Um, can you give us, I'd like a sense of the magnitude of this problem, though over 40% of Canadians admit to having smoked cannabis uh, sometime in their lives, at least adults. Uh, uh, how many Canadians are, are being turned away at the border for this particular reason? Uh, and if I, if I just maybe uh, add a, uh, another jurisdiction to it, um, there are countries like the Netherlands or Portugal where cannabis has been decriminalized. Do we have any data on whether citizens from those countries um, have been died, denied access, uh, uh, for example, to the United States because they were asked and admitted to having consumed cannabis. What's the real world magnitude of this problem is really my, my question. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have specific statistics in terms of admissibility decisions that would have been rendered on the basis of um, admissions of cannabis use in the past, but I think the premise of your question is is, uh, is the right one, which is to suggest that um, a large number of um, Canadians already admit through a number of different uh, vehicles having used cannabis. Um, so I think from our perspective, from a planning perspective, I think we expect um, the American posture, as it was in indicated, not necessarily to change, um, at least based on indications, early indications we have from uh, the American government. So we expect um, the traveling public to experience a similar um, interdiction rate, um, I suppose. Um, that being said, um, I think it's going to be uh, important for us, as we have uh, in the past, and we've, we've had a chance to have ongoing discussions with our American counterparts, but also post-implementation to continue monitoring um, any types of enforcement actions that our American colleagues may uh, be undertaking so to understand the prevalence of the phenomenon and how it, um, it, uh, it uh, may arise in the future. So we'll be in a position to continue doing that through existing mechanism that we have. We have VARES-4 with our uh, Customs and Border Protection um, colleagues at various levels. We have ongoing discussions with them. Uh, so the discussions we have so far is that the interdiction would remain the same. I don't think there's any plans to ask specific questions about uh, past use. But again, they have the sovereign right to determine the admissibility requirements, and that may change. So we cannot speculate about uh, future posture. But the, at the present, I think we're, um, we're reassured by their response. Just a, a brief follow-up. The, the lack of data notwithstanding, do you have anecdotal evidence at least or, or provide the committee with some sense of the extent to which these questions actually are asked at the border by American counterparts? Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't wish to speculate on that. Thank you. Well, uh, yeah, let me follow up on that very, very briefly. The, uh, so somebody goes to the border, they don't have any possession uh, of cannabis on them, but they are asked the question, have they used cannabis? And of course, at that point in time, at some future point in time, it will be absolutely legal in Canada to have consumed it. And yet, you're saying a border guard can still ask if they've consumed cannabis, and if they say yes, because you say that they sh should always tell the truth, that, that, that if they say yes, they could be, that border guard could determine that they're banned for life. Uh, banned certainly on that occasion, maybe banned for life. Uh, what, what recourse uh, do people have on that? I mean, a, a, a legal substance in Canada, even legal in some of the states, in the United States, not by the federal authority, of course, but in some states. So uh, what legal recourse would somebody have uh, from a border guard just deciding, okay, you're banned for life because you once had a weed? So 
Sorry. Chair, I mean, that's an important question, but I don't think, um, I'm not aware, I, I can look into that, the answer in terms of the legal recourse from, from American counterparts that there could be for a decision like that. I would just highlight that, yes, there is discretion for border guards, but in early discussions with our American counterparts, uh, they're not intending to ask in their primary about cannabis use. That's what they've told us. However, if there are, if there are indicators that somebody has been using cannabis, so for example, if somebody comes up and there's the smell of cannabis or somebody is indicating that uh, they may be impaired, um, then you could probably assume that border guards will go through their natural order of asking questions uh, in terms of uh, cannabis. Uh, and that will lead to a logical conclusion. Uh, they could be referred to secondary, et cetera. So those risks do, um, do exist. But not just uh, if there is no sign, not just they're not going to ask a question. Your understanding is they're not going to ask a question, have you ever used cannabis? Yeah, our understanding from, uh, from our uh, colleagues in the Canada Border, uh, or, uh, the CBP organization, uh, is that they won't be having a question on cannabis usage uh, in primary, which is virtually okay. the initial sort of interaction between right. people stopping the well, border. Well, it's good to get uh, that clarified. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, Senator Munson. Uh, you read my mind. I, I wish we could talk in sort of layperson's terms and that what Canadians who are watching understand about this. Is there a written agreement that the first question will not, the primary question will not be about that. I mean, as the chair talked about, 40% of Canadians have smoked marijuana. Um, and uh, you can get, border guards can get very, uh, very aggressive at the border. They, they have their own suspicions and the rest of it. So I, I'm not assured here today that uh, people who have smoked marijuana in the past, that it's uh, just assume uh, that question will not be asked. I, I wish you could just give us some more assurances that uh, that there is a, an agreement between two the two countries that, that that is not part of the primary questioning because I think it will be because I think it'll be a top shelf at that the time that this uh, bill becomes law. Have you talked to any? Have they give you? I mean, you said you have assurances. Well, you all get assurances. Uh, is anything written? Well, I think the minister was asked the same question um, when he was in committee, and, and I think his answer was that it's highly unlikely that the Americans would agree to accept to such an agreement. Um, and I think um, the, the same is probably true for Canada as well. We have to also uh, keep in mind that the officers and their day-to-day -day interactions is the same for uh, Canada Border Services Agency. They maintain a certain level of discretion to be able to proceed with a progressive examination. So some of those questions may be asked based on specific indicators or uh, potential <coughs> suspicions that the, uh, the, the border guard may have. So to conclude an agreement that would essentially eliminate, um, eliminate the uh, discretion of officers um, is very likely something that our American counterparts would be very reluctant to conclude as it would also have an impact on their ability to determine their own admissibility requirements. Uh, another question has to do with pardons. Uh, sometimes I feel we have the, the cart before the horse. There are tens of thousands of Canadians who still have a criminal record uh, because of simple possession of marijuana. And of course, they cannot go to the United States of America. Uh, and here we are, the Prime Minister has hinted that perhaps after this is all said and done, uh, pardons will happen. Has there been any discussions with any of you uh, behind the scenes of preparing a plan, an official plan for those who have pardons that will come to light once this bill becomes law? And has the United States of America been informed that this country will do the uh, fair thing uh, very soon and issue pardons for those who have been convicted of simple possession. Senator, thanks for the question. I would just say that the, the government understands that, you know, pardons or as we call it, record um, suspensions um, are important. And so I know we've been leading a review of, of pardons in terms of more generally, not only uh, just with respect to um, um, uh, cannabis 
Uh, and so there is ongoing discussion going on around uh, pardons uh, at this time. Um, those are ongoing, so there isn't necessarily any outcome, but certainly I would just say in terms of uh, its relationship to cannabis that those considerations are going on. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, Senator Manning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you to our witnesses again. Um, my question is for the uh, RCMP, I believe. Senator Bosley asked a question to Minister Goodale on February the 1st. How many RCMP detachments have a drug recognition expert on staff 24 hours a day? Your department produced a number of DREs but did not answer the question. I'm hoping to get some more information today. Can you tell us how many RCMP detachments have a 24 hour day staffing by drug recognition experts? Uh, thank you for the question, Senator. Um, I can't tell you today how many have 24-7. Uh, the way uh, we deploy is that we would expect to have access to a drug recognition expert 24-7. Uh, so we would have access to that person. So that person uh, may be in a neighboring detachment, may be in a neighboring, may be on call. There might be various uh, opportunities there to engage a drug recognition expert. I can tell you that um, uh, RCMP National Traffic Services um, uh, are taking the lead in uh, enhancing uh, the numbers of uh, DRE personnel, both within the RCMP and within um, uh, police, the police community in Canada. Right now, uh, the last time I checked at the beginning, beginning of May, we had 743 trained drug recognition officers um, across the country, both RCMP and non-RCMP police personnel. Uh, to, so to answer your question, for the RCMP, now I'm only speaking for the RCMP, uh, we look at different deployment models in order to um, handle whatever uh, <laughs> demand may be there. So we would look at either an on-call model, we would look at a neighboring detachment, we would look for access to that, similar to the alcohol regime where uh, we have intoxilizer technicians as we call them, uh, uh, I can't guarantee uh, somebody on the alcohol side is working 24-7. However, I can guarantee there's access to somebody. Okay. Thank you. Uh, maybe just a segue into that, talking about alcohol. I'm, I'm wondering about your concern, or we, we have heard from several witnesses uh, concerning in relation to the signs, the development of the signs to determine uh, if a person behind the wheel is impaired by, by uh, uh, cannabis. Uh, can you give us any idea or any um, information, might be a better way of putting it, on uh, the progress on that, uh, you know, from, from the RCMP point of view, where we too, you know, if this comes into law within the next couple of months, that we, how do we determine or how do you uh, address that situation on our highways? Yes, yeah, so uh, from the policing community, the RCMP specifically, um, drug recognition experts uh, or people we call standard field sobriety testing, uh, they're not new uh, to policing. They're, they have been existing for quite some time. Uh, what we are doing is uh, increasing uh, the training, the availability. Uh, if, for instance, this fiscal year, 1819, we're looking at putting on uh, an additional 22 <coughs> Uh, drug recognition expert training courses uh, for all of policing across Canada. So um, the the uh, the mechanisms, the ability to enforce uh, impaired driving, both alcohol and drug related, exists now. Uh, what we're working towards is enhancing that ability and making sure on the general awareness of our officers, plus the specific. Um, skills of our SFST trained people, standard field sobriety testing people and drug recognition experts are enhanced across the policing community. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Dean. Thank you, uh, thanks, Chair. Thanks uh, for the terrific advice and information today um, from our government colleagues. Um, I noted uh, at one of the committee hearings that immigration lawyer Lauren Waldman uh, testified that under a legal and regulated uh, cannabis regime, Canada's ability to argue for a change in current U.S. border practices would be considerably enhanced. And I, I note a reference in the last sentence to Section 7 of the report that, 
that kind of alludes to uh, to that point um, uh, in in calling for uh, an approach that would uh, uh, to to U.S. discussions discussions with the U.S. that that would uh, that would reference uh, a legal activity following uh, the coming into force of C45. Is it to the extent that you can uh, comment on this? Um, do you think that uh, Mr. Waldman had a good point? Okay. Um, well, Mr. Wallman and uh, CBSA have a long-standing relationship. <laughs> starting with that, um, I think I think the point that Mr. Wallman was trying to make is one about moral authority in our negotiations with American colleagues, and I think the point that he was trying to um, to explain is that if it is if recreational use is actually a legal activity in Canada or not illegal. Uh, perhaps he would change the American stance with respect to their own admissibility requirements. Again, I can say that the Americans have shown great interest in our legislative uh, proposed legislative changes. Um, we have had numerous discussions with them to try to explain how the legislative framework would actually work in practice. Um, so they've paid great attention to this, but we've also tried to reassure them in terms of our own uh, enforcement posture that the prohibitions that currently exist will continue to exist, and that we have actually allocated additional staff to our own um, ports of entry in order to be able to detect um, potential trafficking of, uh, of cannabis moving forward. So I think our strategy has been one of information, and we hope that this information will eventually lead to, um, to uh, inform decisions by American officials with respect to their own admissibility requirements. But uh, I wouldn't go any further than that to, um, to either agree or disagree with Mr. Wallman. Completely understandable. Thank you. Thanks, <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, Senator Ahmedvar. Thank you, Chair, and thank you all for being here. Um, cannabis has been legalized in more than a few states in the U.S., and some of these states border uh, Canada. How do we deal when American visitors are coming to Canada? What questions do we ask them? And have we adjusted these processes over time as more American states have legalized cannabis? I'm just trying to turn the mirror a little on ourselves here to gain some wisdom as to what we want our American counterparts to do. Sorry, is the question, uh, what should we ask American well, what travelers? Do we, what do we currently do when American visitors come across the border? Does the CBSA ask them a question about have you used cannabis? Because right now it's illegal in our country. Yes, right now it's not a mandatory question. We're not asking about uh, any specific cannabis so you, use. We, we don't ask ever. It's not that we don't ask ever. It would be threat or risk-based uh, question. Mm -hmm. And we have, generally, we train our officers to do progressive examinations. So if they're indicators again, mm -hmm. there's potentially imports um, occurring, then the officer may actually make a determination to refer that individual to secondary for further examination. But it would likely be based on specific indicators. Uh, but not necessarily through systemic uh, asking of questions, which is what we plan on doing and, moving forward. And have our processes changed over time because more U.S. states have legalized cannabis? No, our processing has not changed. Thank you. So, follow up on that. So it sounds like it mirrors the U.S. process. It sounds like you're doing the same thing that they would do. Uh, if somebody, if somebody seems to be intoxicated, you might ask those kind of questions, Correct. but you don't ask it as a primary question of whether or not uh, they've ever done it. Uh, but in, in both cases, it's also illegal to bring it across the border either way. Right. So it's a parallel situation pretty well at the moment. Yeah, and it's important to recognize that the uh, prohibitions that currently exist will continue to exist. So in an enforcement, from an enforcement perspective and from a border processing perspective, nothing has uh, truly changed. 
Um, so I think we have to keep that in mind. And uh, in terms of our officers, the officers will also have access to various tools uh, and uh, access to various sources of information. So for example, someone who might have been in the past uh, convicted of drug-related offense might be subjected to a secondary examination. There's various factors that could actually lead to an individual to be referred to secondary. Yep. Further questions? Thank you very much. Uh, <coughs> the, the report from our committee uh, suggests in recommendation three that Canada explore a bilateral agreement with the U.S. to cover off all these uh, questions. Do you think we need an agreement, or do you believe current processes can be adapted in order to fit the new reality? Thanks for the question, Chair and Senator. Just, I don't think an agreement is necessarily what we need. Um, and just for all the reasons that my uh, colleague from the Canada Border Services Agency kind of explained in terms of the difficulty um, with balancing a hard sort of steadfast agreement with other things such as officer sort of um, flexibility in terms of questioning, that's very difficult. I do think there are other sort of avenues that you can pursue, though, that, that we, we are trying to do. Uh, uh, a little less formally than an agreement, there are a number of existing sort of um, committees, engagements um, um, at the official level uh, for many of the departments that are here that are, that are ongoing, uh, where many of these issues are, are, are being discussed uh, and can be resolved. Um, and they're going on now, and these will continue to go on after, after cannabis is, is legalized. Um, if, if, if the bill is passed. So um, I would just say that I think the general impression is um, I don't think an agreement is necessarily uh, necessary. I think it would be hard uh, to get an agreement, um, but that shouldn't preclude us from doing other activities in terms of pursuing these issues that are being raised. Okay, thank you. Senator O. Oh. Thank you. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. My question will be same as a border, border crossing and international travel. First, you know, for U.S. border uh, crossing, you know, w there's no guarantee that American won't step up tougher check once uh, cannabis C45 legalized. And uh, there is a waiver. If you are stopped of crossing the U.S., it will cost $1,000 to get a waiver to uh, once a year to be able to get back to U.S. So would the government has any, you know, plan that to help the people that, uh, you know, that are stopped on these issues need to apply for a waiver? Thanks very much for the question, Chair and Senator. Just with respect to the waiver, um, I'm not sure of the assistance you're, 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 you're implying, Senator, but just if, just if uh, I could just um, maybe just um, interpret what, what uh, the question is. Um, again, we're not setting the process in terms of um, what our American counterparts are, are going to do around entry into uh, the United States. Currently, the process is a waiver system, um, and as you mentioned, there is a cost to that. Yeah. Um, we aren't contemplating at this time um, in, the, in the federal government in terms of um, uh, providing any type of um, assistance or uh, for Canadians. That, that's purely an American process that's set by them in terms of the conditions, the cost, et cetera. Um, so at this time, no, the federal government isn't, isn't contemplating anything with respect to the U.S. waiver for entry if you're denied. Okay, my second question is for international travel. You know, in uh, Asia Pacific Rim country, like Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand, all the way, to carry uh, any drugs into their country is serious punishment, including capital punishment. Last year, six Australians were hung in uh, Indonesia just for drug traffic, drug trafficking. So how are we, you know, making this awareness to uh, young Canadian, you know, for international traveling? 
Senator, maybe I'll just turn to, to my colleague at the CBSA to answer that. And I, I just remind, too, that uh, colleagues from Global Affairs are on the next panel, and that might be a, a good question to pose to uh, my colleagues from uh, Global Affairs as well. And I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll just um, I think the question would probably be better answered by our colleagues from Global Affairs. Can I, what I can say, though, is that um, any international traveler has certain responsibilities and obligations prior to departure, one of which is actually to inform themselves about the laws um, that are actually are applicable in the countries they're going to be visiting and traveling. Uh, so in doing so, I think it's the government's responsibility to provide some information to the traveling public, and I think uh, Global Affairs Canada has uh, initiated additional work uh, to try to provide travel advisory in that respect. Um, and as it's done uh, typically, so there's a number of different travel advisory that are available to the Canadian um, traveling public. And um, I think that is um, a vehicle by which information is disseminated to Canadians. I'm not sure Thank if that answers your question. Thank you. The Global Affairs is coming up, Senator O, on the next panel. Uh, Senator Poirier. Thank you, Peter. Most of my questions have been answered, but I just want to add to one. Um, when we're crossing into the United States, if we need to have prescription medication with us, usually there's no issue of bringing it across. Uh, medical marijuana. I know it's been uh, legal in Canada for a number of years, and I, I'm assuming it probably wasn't questioned much at the border or going through duty uh, with it, but coming forward, is that going to be more complicated? Uh, what's going to be the issue with medical marijuana, even if they have a prescription, uh, with the issues that are going on with the legalization right now of the marijuana crossing over to the United States? So it's a pretty uh, simple question to answer. Uh, as it stands today, you can't take it across the border, uh, even if you're an individual authorized to possess it and use it in Canada for medical reasons, and we're not proposing to change that going forward. Okay. Thank you. Hmm. Okay, uh, Senator Deacon. <laughs> you, Thank Senator you. Uh, I'll leave my first question to Global Affairs, and my second question is actually oh. specific to um, Chief Superintendent Daly. And um, I see in the work that you do that part of your work is uh, leading Aboriginal policing. And I just was wondering today, with, with the gift of you here, if you could share with us uh, anything that you are anticipating or um, planning for, wondering about, as it relates to the legalization of cannabis and the policing aspect of your work with the Indigenous communities. Um, certainly, I, I would answer that, that I'm no more concerned about the indigenous community than the impact on on broader uh, uh, Canadians. Um, we are doing a tremendous amount of work on the education side um, of our own employees with respect to uh, the Cannabis Act mm -hmm. uh, and so that our own employees will be um, well versed in in the the uh, the act when it is passed, and um, uh, you know, serving in some of our northern communities uh, does present some challenges for the RCMP, mm -hmm. specifically simply on uh, the ability to staff those and to uh, have a regular mobile police force that that just impacts service delivery. Uh, whether it be towards the Cannabis Act or not. Um, policing tends to be uh, uh, tends to be always kind of a fallback position. We do rely heavily on our on our partners, mm -hmm. uh, government partners in order to provide um, services, uh, kind of a wraparound service so uh, that we can assist. Uh, anybody um, with respect to youth um, you know we have a, a large focus on uh, youth be it Aboriginal or not uh, with through our crime prevention services and access to uh, websites and social media that we're doing a lot of awareness and, and uh, that sort of campaign um, so to answer your question I think um, uh, 
the, the unknown when it comes to law enforcement as to the public safety impacts of any change uh, is what kind of concerns me, I guess, is that uh, any sort of change, whether it's a new law, a new uh, technique, a new implication on policing, is what generally concerns me versus uh, a specific, because uh, policing is very good at reacting and reinventing itself and finding solutions to, uh, to a service delivery issue. Um, so what keeps me awake at night is just simply um, uh, the whole public safety aspect, whether it be home cultivation, whether it be, you know, just how will, um, how will things change going forward? Thank you. And I, I put that to you because exactly that change piece would be significant in the work you're doing. Absolutely. And um, we have heard extensively from the Aboriginal, uh, the APPA committee about readiness and request for delay. And so as I was asking that question today, today I was trying to think about that even being more um, acute or perhaps and more of a concern in a population that says we're not ready. And so we can say that probably coast to coast to coast in some <coughs> aspects, but in that particular uh, group, that's why I asked the question. Thank you. It, it, it does raise, in my mind, another question that's relevant to this border issue. Uh, there are uh, reservations that uh, overlap the borders uh, between Canada and the United States. Are there still hard border services in, in those uh, communities, or how would how would this work in terms of cannabis going back and forth on a reservation that, in effect, is going both sides of the border? Anybody got an answer on that? No? Maybe that doesn't exist I can anymore. attempt to answer that. Um, I think the, uh, the entry requirements um, remain uh, the same. Uh, it does present some challenges in specific communities where, because of geographic dispositions, the, um, the port of entry may not necessarily be placed in an ideal situation. So in those cases, I think we have, um, we have discussions at a local level to ensure that there's a, a common understanding of the entry requirements moving forward so that we can have smooth implementation. Okay. But I think um, holistically, I think from a, um, from a border perspective, the entry requirements will remain the same. Okay, uh, Senator Tennis. Uh, things. First of all, I'm just curious, because we have a, there is an opposite, equal opposite issue between Canada and the United States, and that would be Americans that turn up the border with handguns. Um, do we see that a lot? Uh, where, where an American citizen, perfectly legal to have a handgun, in some states even hidden on your person, um, show up at our border, you know, in their car uh, with a handgun. Does that happen a lot? And if so, do we refuse them entry and ban them from entering Canada forever? Or how do we handle uh, that situation uh, as it exists now? Um, I'd say it probably happens more often than um, people would imagine. Um, we do have specific signage to that effect uh, to ensure that there's not by um, perhaps uh, an oversight um, on the traveling public. Um, so. American citizens are informed of our entry requirements. They have specific signage. It does impact their admissibility. We do have the ability to seize weapons. We do frequently. We do have the ability to pursue um, criminal charges in some respect as well uh, when circumstances um, are, uh, are such that it may be required. Um, so I'd say it happens fairly frequently and in some parts of the country probably more than others as well. And does that get them on our forever naughty list so they can't come back to Canada if, if that happened? Is that just automatic? There's a variety of scenarios that could be contemplated depending on the actions and the enforcement uh, that would have been taken. Uh, so for example, if there's, if it, if it bleeds into a criminal sanction, then there's definitely going to be some long-term effects. How long that may be and, and the various avenues in order to overturn that admissibility is, uh, is not something necessarily that uh, I can speak to, but there's definitely avenues where that can be done. Okay, and in your, um, in your organization, do you have any 
um, mandate, a reference to a mandate about your role in enabling Canadians to cross into the United States? Our role is very specific. It's to process inbound travelers. Okay, so let me ask you this, because I think you're going to send me to global affairs, but I, I want to I know um, if global affairs comes to you and says, "Look, we we there's a you know we've been contacted by Senator so and so from the United States, and this is his nephew, and he's been refused. Uh, it was all a big mix-up. We think you guys are being unreasonable." How often do you would you welcome that kind of thing, and how often would you change? And what I'm getting at here is, it seems to me that you guys and your counterparts in the United States are the ones that need to have some kind of a common sense uh, platform by which you can, you can sort out little personality things that happen at the border that causes somebody to get on a list because they said the wrong thing, they said something stupid, they lost their temper, they're nasty people but not law-breaking people. Is there anything like that in your minds that would be helpful in your role? and also helpful to Canadians um, trying to go to the Canadians trying to go to the United States. Yeah, I won't, I won't comment on, I won't comment on the various forms of representation we receive from various constituents uh, across the country, including senators perhaps, um, or even from international, um, international uh, partners that we may have. Um, what I'd probably say is that, um, and this is the case for any border agency, I think we're all in the same business, which is essentially to manage the flow of traffic. Um, and in doing so, there's a reason why, and I think it's, it's the case in every administration, there's a fair amount of flexibility and discretion that is uh, provided to officers to make decisions. And, and I think we have to be mindful that we're processing um, over now 100 million people yes. on an annual basis. Um, so there is, um, there is a fair amount of discretion that officers have, and the discretion is, is available so that officers can actually assess the specific case circumstances of, of each case. In some cases, they may be aggravating circumstances that lead to certain enforcement actions, whereas in other cases, it may not be. Um, so I'm not sure there is a, I'm not sure there's a, a clear answer to your specific question, but I'd probably refer to the officer yeah. discretion as the tool that has been put in place in order to deal with the variance in terms of case circumstances. Would, would you uh, say that this problem is about to get significantly worse, if indeed it's a problem? Um, I, think, I think we're equipped to monitor the implementation, um, to see how it will be impacting our processing um, of uh, inbound uh, travelers. We definitely have the capacity to do that. Uh, we have also obtained additional resources, and I think it's important for the committee to appreciate that, to facilitate actually that processing so that we don't uh, create additional border delays. Um, recognizing that we're going to be asking an additional question, and sometimes it, it appears as it's, it's nothing to ask an additional question, but when you're processing 100 million people a year, even the small increment of one question does have an impact. Um, so in all, of our, uh, in all of our preparation, we have um, asked for additional resources and receive additional resources in order to facilitate the processing of returning Canadians or um, uh, foreign nationals. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's the end of round one. I have one person for round two, and that's Senator Munson. Thank you again. I think this question is for the police. Um, uh, I've been reading a, a recent uh, Vice, News a Vice News investigation, and it's based on police data that reveal that Indigenous and Black people have consistently are overrepresented in cannabis possession and arrests in cities. I want you to confirm that before us this morning, if that indeed is true. Uh, and I asked a question, a little preamble in the light of that. These co companies that are licensed by Health Canada do have international partners. And there are many people from a, a long ago background who are now lawyers or business people who are reluctant to even apply to any of these companies uh, to, for a job because uh, in many cases they legally can't or hire people with criminal records uh, for certain positions. 
Uh, I wonder if you would like to comment on that and, and how that reflects upon uh, the minorities in our country and their opportunity to have the same working space and place as others. I can certainly make a comment towards your first um, your first question with respect to uh, uh, overrepresentation. Uh, I think that's what the, uh, the the gist of what you were saying. I'm not familiar with the Vice uh, article, uh, <coughs> nor am I familiar with the exact statistics uh, that you refer to. Uh, what I can say is that, uh, speaking for the RCMP. Uh, every interaction that we have with a person from in the Canadian public, we're governed by the Charter of Rights of Freedoms. We have human rights uh, uh, legislation that we abide by. We have an internal bias-free policing policy that speaks to uh, the absolute requirement to t treat people with dignity and respect. So I would expect officers to adhere to each one of those in every interaction, recognizing that we have hundreds, the RCMP have hundreds of thousands of interactions uh, with Canadians across the country. <coughs> there are also mechanisms uh, that if one of our officers, uh, you know, uh, or the, the, the Canadian public, the person, the client, uh, doesn't feel that they've been treated properly, there are numerous oversight mechanisms, whether you look at, uh, you know, uh, organizations like the Independent Office in British Columbia or the Nova Scotia Serious Incident Response Team uh, or our internal public complaint mechanisms, uh, human rights legislation, all those uh, provide, in my view, the necessary oversight. Um, police are governed by the, the facts or what presents in front of them. Uh, no different than somebody arriving at the port, as we've heard, uh, with certain indicators that uh, then uh, allow the police officer to then uh, conduct a further investigation. So um, that's how policing uh, in Canada works. Uh, I guarantee you there's, there is certainly uh, enough recourse, in my view, that if somebody doesn't feel served correctly, there's enough oversight, and our officers are well aware of that oversight and the ramifications of that oversight, um, whether it be a code of conduct internally, whether it be um, a supervisor discussion, uh, what have you. <coughs> now, with respect to your second question, um, and how people may be disadvantaged from employment? Well, I just, I'm, I'm concerned that in the sense of fairness, do people deserve a second chance? Despite having a criminal, uh, a, what, is, what is a criminal record for simple possession? I, I maybe, yes, from Health Canada I can answer. I, I know it's difficult as, uh, as a senior bureaucrat to, to get into the minutia of all of this, but I'm sure you, 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 you probably have a heartfelt position that would come to the idea that when it comes to people trying to uh, invest or to be part of this, uh, what would be a new industry, and uh, that, the, that there is this opportunity there for all Canadians uh, where there are still legal hurdles uh, to try to overcome. So I'm, yeah. I'm happy to, Thank you. to try and offer a few thoughts, and the Senator and perhaps your colleagues will know by this point that I have no problems descending into the minutia. Oh, good. I missed the first uh, two hours. Yeah, okay. I'm sorry. Um, so there's really kind of two dimensions to what you're asking about. Um, so the, the committee's heard that as a part of the licensing process, the, the regulations today and the regulations that we envision in the future identify certain key members of the company who are determined to occupy positions of influence, whether they are in charge of you know, security of the company, whether they are in charge of uh, you know, the processing. And, like, there, there, there's a series of positions that we've identified as being material. But it's not all the positions in the company. Um, in fact, it's, it's frankly probably a minority of the positions in, in, in the company. So uh, hiring decisions around and whether or not the existence of, as, as to use your example, uh, a long past you know, distant charge for drug possession, let's say, as an example, whether or not that would have create a barrier to employment in one of these non-essential positions is really a company decision. 
they all have their own hiring processes. And, 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 and in some instances it may, and in some instances it, it may not. Um, with respect to those positions of influence, uh, and, and this is this is detailed in both of those regulatory papers that I've mentioned on a, on a couple of occasions. So if you're interested, perhaps that's something you might want to, to look at. But we acknowledge that there there are like that the, the idea is in those positions of influence, we want to ensure that the persons that occupy it are are there, that there are no direct or frankly even indirect links to organized crime. So we're really looking at anything that would compromise the integrity of, of the regime, of the operations of the regime. That, but, and if you look at the, sort of the, 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 the minutia of the regulations, that a person may have a past charge uh, for possession as an example, doesn't, doesn't by default exclude them from getting a security clearance. The regulator working in partnership with our friends at the RCMP will look at the facts before us and then we will make a decision with whether based on all the facts presented, whether that person presents a threat or a risk such that we don't want to issue a clearance. But simply having a criminal record or a, for, for possession or something like that doesn't de facto mean that you're, uh, you're rejected. Thank you very much. Uh, that brings us to an end of this uh, particular panel. And uh, I, I won't pause. We'll just quickly change the folks at the end of the table there. Uh, except for the Health Canada folks, and we'll be joined by uh, people from Global Affairs Canada.